Scubs, good good of you to join us in the build-up to the Spanish Grand Prix. One of the more interesting teams, I think, we we'll both agree, is going to be McLaren Honda because mm-hmm. their resources are so vast, their facilities are so vast, both in the UK at Woking and indeed in Japan. And, and we know now that Japan have massively, Honda Japan have massively ramped up their facilities and the number of people involved on this engine program now uh, to try to get the thing back on, on course or onto course. I wouldn't say back on the course. And that's going to be really interesting to see how that develops over the next few races. But in the meantime, we've seen, thanks to our friends at Race Car Engineering Magazine, we've seen some really, really nice images of the engine, which you've now parlayed into some extremely nice drawings of your own. And we've got some detail here of the engine that we've, uh, it's quite unusual to have so much detail of this engine. And now we can talk about it in a fairly confident way, if I can phrase it that way <laughs> absolutely i mean cl- clear pictures of power units are uh, are very rare uh or, of the honda power unit incredibly rare this is pretty much the only reference that we have apart from a few video shots during uh, free practice of buttons um battery system being removed from the car so the, there still are some secrets tucked away deep inside but we now can start to see how Honda have laid this engine out and tried to package everything into the smallest possible envelope, um, potentially for the advantage uh, in, in the chassis. Yeah, but uh, aerodynamic advantages, and, and that's always something that we've seen race car designers trying to do over the years, even before ground effect was invented. They're always trying to mm. keep the thing as slim as possible. Um, of course, the interesting point is whether or not the amount of work that goes into making such a tight back end of the car is worth the trouble in italics um and and whether uh, uh, let's let's look at that from another angle which is how good is the mclaren chassis if we can isolate it from the engine we've talked about this before um and i my sources tell me that down at woking they're saying at the moment that they don't think it's that good aerodynamically in terms of downforce and that it's the engine power unit uh, deficiencies at the moment account for possibly only 30 to 50 percent of the difference between McLaren and Mercedes right now so mm. that would suggest that aerodynamically that car still has been kind to it a lot more potential that needs to be wrung out of it equally that the sculpted very tight rear end isn't just necessarily giving them any sort of big advantage out of the box Absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say McLaren uh, on their chassis side and the aerodynamics over the past few years have lagged behind the uh, the leaders, which we would argue would be Red Bull and more recently Mercedes. And you know, I think there's a, a process maturing going on at McLaren. Obviously, you've got Pete Prod come over from Red Bull. Uh, he started to put some work into the car and we're already in the first few races seeing parts brought to the car. I think we're expecting a much bigger package over the next few races. And, you know, They've got a long way to go, and you know, again, we talk about this size zero rear end. I mean, it, it's important, and there's huge amounts of potential in it, um, but it doesn't. It's not a silver bullet. Just doing that, as you know, as we were we were speaking earlier, it's much like Williams' super slim gearbox from a few years ago. It's not the sole key to improve their aerodynamic performance. It's it's a big factor in something you can later uh, take advantage of. But I think at this stage, I don't think McLaren have unlocked that potential and got the rest of the car working around uh, the rear end that they've got there so yeah i mean maybe mclaren don't have the chassis now but you can see that the work they have put in potentially you know um as the year progresses will then start to to reap some rewards well let's hope so let's have a look now in detail at some of the more interesting aspects of this engine yeah absolutely so if we just have a look at the sort of the image here which just shows you pretty much the whole engine package um yeah, at first glimpse, it looks very much a conventional package. It's got elements of both the, the Ferrari, the Renault, and the Mercedes power units in there. So you have at the front the uh, the battery pack. And interestingly, Honda have decided to put all of their control electronics inside the same compartment, the same uh, uh, cover as the battery, which does potentially give you some cooling problems. It also means that the entire package tends to be a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter because you've got less wiring and coolant running around. Then we go over to the power unit, and they've kind of split their ideas between, as I said previously, sort of the Renault, Ferrari, which are very similar, and the Mercedes. So they have split the turbocharger, which we kind of knew already from the shape of the airbox, in that the exhaust-driven turbine is at the back of the engine, driven by a quite 
quite t- uh, tightly packaged exhaust, very similar to last year's uh, Mercedes-style log exhaust. Uh, and then we knew, again, from that we could guess and we can see the orange wires coming out, that the MGUH is in the V of the engine. But what's interesting is they've actually brought the turbocharger, the, the compressor end of the turbocharger, which compresses the air to go back into the engine, have actually brought that into the V of the engine. Now, if we remember looking back at the Mercedes engine, they had a very large, almost dinner plate sized turbocharger compressor hanging off the front of the engine, which then actually went, went into a recess in the back of the fuel tank. Mm-hmm. Honda have kept this envelope smaller by putting the turbocharger in the V, but because of that, they can't have a very large diameter centrifugal uh, compressor, which is what we're more used to in Formula One. So they've had to find a different format of compressor to fit into that much smaller space. Now, there's various regulations, there's lots of physics and um, you know, uh, pre-existing turbocharger designs. It's not entirely clear what type of compressor they're running. I tend to think they're looking much more at an axial compressor, which is almost much like a jet engine where you have you know, a straight fan on a shaft rather than a typical turbocharger where you have these shaped fans which throw the air centrifugally out. Um, the, the, the fact what type of turbo it is in the end, maybe somewhere between the two, that it's what we call a mixed flow. But uh, it's definitely tending towards that sort of direction where they're bringing the, the, the radius of the, co- the compressor into being about much smaller. This makes it um, much less able to deliver huge amounts of boost. But of course, you've got to remember with the limited fuel that these engines have, you don't, you can't run massive amounts of boost. And equally, with lots of the clever ways they are able to run uh, the compressor and keep it up to speed, it means that the compressor won't slow down too much as well. So there, there's, there's still stuck clever stuff there. Whether we actually ever find out exactly how Honda have done this compressor will be interesting. Um, but again, when we start to look at this, you see the, the oil tank is on the front, which is somewhat surprising. I thought that would have been behind the engine to minimize the impact on the, uh, the size of the fuel tank and make, to make the fuel tank longer. But they also have some quite interesting inlets. The, uh, the inlet chamber over the engine is actually made from a, a huge piece of machined aluminium. Yeah. It probably started out something the, the, the size of a coffee table and is now reduced into this lovely th- thin wall cover. Inside this, the inlets are turned at 90 degrees. Um, which means that the the, the, the height of the uh, inlet plenum is much lower. Obviously, they've had to raise it up a little bit because of the turbo and everything being inside. So it's all, lots of things have led to lots of other design solutions. They've got variable inlet, inlets, um, which um, not every other team, I don't, we don't believe Ferrari are running variable length inlets on, on their engine as well. Um, so that's it's all quite interesting stuff. There is some very conventional things. Again, we believe that the things like the oil pump and the water pump were all tucked into the back of the gearbox. It turns out that they're not. We can see them at the side of the engine. Equally, the MGUK, the uh, effectively the Kurs motor, as we would use in old language, isn't, again, at the back of the motor. It's underneath the left-hand cylinder bank in a relatively conventional position. Um, as we would suspected from quite early in the engine's development, it drives the back of the crankshaft rather than the nose, which is what everybody else does. Um, and that's just you know to do with the harmonics of the crankshaft and you know, where you're putting the gears and the weight and everything. So this is all very interesting. It's, it's, it's unusual that we're able to confirm so much from so few pictures, such as the clarity of these, these images. Yes, and, and looking at it and looking at that lovely drawing, it's, it, it does hit you in the face. Honda are a very serious engine company, Formula One-wise, mm-hmm. and it's difficult to imagine that this thing isn't going to come together pretty quickly because it looks, it looks phenomenal, looks beautiful in the way we can see it here mm-hmm. it, it, it's actually it's a bit like going to the technology center in woking the mclaren headquarters and wondering how they can be qualifying at the back of the grid when you see a facility <laughs> like that it's a bit the same you Ab- see this engine absolutely. now and you wonder how can this engine not be a really quick engine um, let's go yes. back to the turbo scarves what sort of materials are the t- is the turbo made in now do you think um, well, typically the, the casings are made from aluminium. Um, you know, the, 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 on the compressor side, the temperatures are much lower, so you can get away with different things. Teams are also, in the development of these compressor housings, they're actually using 3D printing to rapidly produce um, relatively low stress part uh, in order to change the geometries in play about. Internally, then, you would have, um, you know, steel or titanium shafts. It's all 
the, 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 the complexities in things like the bearings and the seals and the, the detailed geometry of it, a lot of the materials, particularly on the, the cooler compressor side, aren't quite so critical. At the back end where you have uh, obviously the exhaust blowing, you're then moving into things like titaniums and uh, Inconel. Um, steel is still used in cobalt steel if they're having a particularly high uh, temperature, which probably they don't as I understand um, on the exhaust side of the, of the turbo exhaust side on, on Formula 1 at the moment, but no doubt that will be something that may well change as they really lean out the mixtures to make the most of the limited fuel available and temperatures invariably will rise inside that um, turbine housing at the back of the engine. I was, I was really wondering whether any carbon has found its way into the t actual turbocharger blades. Um, from what I can see, the, almost it's unusual that Honda are using a, a, a surprising amount of machined aluminium around, particularly around the inlets and as I explained in the, uh, the uh, inlet uh, uh, chamber. So I, I think w where the engine is on its sort of you know, uh, maturity, it's still going up the scale. It's still a relatively uh, young and untested engine. I think they will only start to really think about things like carbon composites in, on the inlet side and particularly it's probably unlikely to ever come into compressor housings, but there are you know, areas where it can be used. So I think the, it may, that may be in subsequent um, years or um, once once they've got some, some tokens to spare um, on the uh, specification that they can start to bring composites in. At the moment, Honda seems to be very happy machining stuff from big, big lumps of aluminium. Yes, well, and so it goes on. It's It's brilliant to see this. It's kind of a shame we don't see all the engines in this form and and we can see the beauty of this technology and this engineering on a regular basis because ultimately that is what formula one is all about it's an engineering led championship and it behoves the teams as best they can to mm -hmm. share that that technology with us and, and it's i know this has come surreptitiously but nonetheless it's wonderful to see this and and to see these yeah. details and thank you so much for talking us through that i suppose we need to end by talking about the engine note of the Honda, particularly mm. on Overrun, which is a discussion you and I have been having for quite a long time now, not only on full throttle, out of the full throttle Overrun, but even on part and, and half throttle Overrun, the engine sounds completely different to the other three, and it's got this very strange rattling sound. Mm. I don't think we should go into now what, what you and I actually think that is, but <laughs> it's certainly a different engine in that regard as well, so there could well be another mysterious area of this Honda engine that makes it very different from the from the norm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the key things that we've, we've found amongst all the, these um, engine manufacturers with a fuel limited formula and the benefit of some of these hybrid systems that the or the, the, all of these engines have, that teams have all each find their own way of, of mapping the engine and getting the best drivability out of the engine with the turbo with the hybrid systems and. Uh, you know, Mercedes have found a way last year. We know that Ferrari had some quite unusual ways of doing this, and clearly Honda have found their own direction. So it, it's it's a, a source of fascination, and sadly still hugely secretive. Um, when really, like in the uh, the WEC, where they should be shouting about how fantastic this technology is. Yeah, well, we're shouting now about this one, and uh, thanks again to our friends at Race Car Engineering, but equally to you, Scarbs, for that very very detailed analysis. Cheers, Peter. <laughs>